Good afternoon. This is uh, Dave Buggy with Behringer Associates. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started as we uh, are just uh, past 1 p.m. here. So this is uh, part two in our two-part series on uh, customer relationship management in the uh, distribution space. And in this session, we're going to be talking about uh, technology and how it can help boost sales and productivity. And we're fortunate again uh, today to have Barry Trailer from CSO Insights joining us. And uh, Barry will be leading uh, the first part of our session today. So I want to talk a little bit about the GoToWebinar client. Uh, a couple of things that are important. First uh, is that you're in listen-only mode uh, for the duration of the presentation. And uh, there is a mechanism in your client to ask a question. If you have a question or would like uh, to give us some feedback, please go ahead and type that into the uh, enter a question for staff box in your GoToMeeting client. Also, if you'd like to see more screen uh, for real estate, you can toggle full screen mode. And then you can also hide the GoToWebinar client uh, by clicking the orange arrow button in your GoToMeeting client. As I said, my name is Dave Buggy with Behringer Associates, and uh, we are an IT services company based in New Jersey, focusing very heavily on the distribution and supply chain uh, industries. And a little bit about us, uh, we've been in business for 19 years and uh, have been implementing CRM for supply chain for over 15 years. We've been working with the Microsoft Dynamics CRM product since its release. We are a gold certified Microsoft Solutions partner and in the top 1% of their partner channel worldwide. We've also been selected as Microsoft's industry partner for wholesale distribution and supply chain. We also offer a very unique version of Microsoft Dynamics CRM specifically built for wholesale distribution and supply chain. And we're going to talk a bit about that towards the end. And a little bit about our CRM practice here at Behringer. Uh, we do offer full implementation expertise, starting with project planning and needs analysis, down through implementation, customization of the solution, training, support, and can even manage your implementation of Microsoft Dynamics CRM. A couple of the other things that we do as a company and invite you to visit our website to learn more is that we also have an IT uh, and network services division of our company. We offer internet and cloud computing and offer business telephone systems and voice over IP. So with that, I'd like to introduce Barry Trailer from CSO Insights. Uh, as I said, Barry's going to be leading the uh, first part of our session today. Good afternoon, Barry. Hi, Dave. Glad to be here. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Great. And Barry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good deal. Uh, let's see if advancing the slides is working on my end now. Good deal. Um, yeah, I uh, again want to thank everybody for, um, for for joining us today, for taking time out and uh, try and make it a valuable at hour for you. A um, couple of things. Last time we talked about levels of relationship and uh, and sales process and the SRP matrix, and we're going to revisit those again today, um, but want to do that from a slightly different um, angle. And for those of you who were with us last week, uh, it will not be a complete uh, repeat. We're going to attack this from a little different uh, approach. For those of you who were not uh, on last week's uh, session, um, it was recorded, and I, I would invite you to go back and, and um, listen to that as well, because again, it was a different tee up. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about how technology impacts performance uh, based on figures from our 2012 sales performance optimization survey. If you're not familiar with CSO Insights, we are an independent third party research firm. And what we research is business to business sales effectiveness. We survey several thousand companies every year. Uh, we have a a survey running all the time. If you visit our website uh, right now, our, our, the survey that's up is our sales compensation and performance management survey. But again, the figures I'll be trotting out uh, a little bit later from our 2012 SPO survey, we had uh, a couple thousand companies respond to that. So, and then Dave's going to talk a little bit about what they do, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. In terms of um, levels of relationship, been talking about this now for several years, and I think in many ways 
folks are a little too casual about how they describe relationships. And so we defined five levels of relationship from vendor uh, up through preferred supplier, uh, consultant, contributor, and partner. And again, talked about the various levels uh, last week. One of the other things we talked about are things that increase and decrease as you move up through levels of relationship. Uh, for example, as you move up through levels of relationship, some of the things that increase are uh, access, uh, familiarity with your customers' business and your customers' customers, uh, greater understanding of what, what they do, and in, in conjunction with that understanding, your ability to add greater value, perspective, and so on. You know, I know in the in the distribution space, an example of a higher level of relationship, uh, you know, maybe at the contributor or even partner level would be when you manage their inventory. You know, vendor managed inventory, you're actually part of their organization, helping you know keep things running smoothly. Uh, all of those things, um, referrals, repeat business, and so on, are things that increase as you move up. Things that decrease number of competitors, price sensitivity, barriers, and so on. Again, we talked about all those last week. But there are other things that are interesting to look at in terms of um, the nature of the conversation, the relationship as you move up through levels. And um, what can be said is at the lowest levels, uh, they're more tactical. As you move up through levels, it becomes more strategic. And at the highest levels, where you're really sort of in and involved in understanding their organization, uh, I think those might best be uh, described as political. If you've ever heard yourself say it was a political decision, meaning you were the technically correct decision, but for some other reason, you know, it went to a competitor. Um, I'm sure everybody's had that experience. What I would say is they're all political decisions. Uh, if they're of any significance, and um, recognizing that is another reason why you want to move toward higher level relationships. Um, another thing that that can be said about tactical uh, versus strategic, um, the the time frame uh, for the decisions increases as you move up. At the lowest levels, vendor, preferred supplier, uh, people are are you know taking you know, a 30-day trial. Um, as you move up through levels of relationship, uh, they may be uh, working with you on a, on a sole source for a one-year or a multi-year agreement. And so the time frame and the nature of the agreements is also increasing as you move up through levels. Another way of looking at it is um, at the lower levels of relationship are transactions at the higher levels are interactions. So transactions are characterized as rapid, repetitive, routine, rapid, repetitive, routine. At higher levels, interactions are complex, creative, protracted. And if you think about that for a second, one of my favorite examples of a transaction is going to get money from the bank. You know, you used to go in, you used to wait in line for someone, you know, for a teller and, and get some cash. Now, you know, you just go to an ATM, and the ATMs are everywhere. I mean, they've become you know, really ubiquitous. Um, you, you can't do all of your banking through ATMs, although increasingly uh, you can do more and more, and now you can do a lot more online. But the thing that enables that is technology. And so when you look at your own business and your, your interactions with uh, with your customers, uh, the thing that, that we say is that technology is constantly eroding the base of this. And um, what that looks like is, you know, these, these repetitive, rapid uh, uh, transactions are really now increasingly being taken over by e-commerce, by self-service, by telesales. Technology is constantly eroding the base, and that's not a bad thing. That's just a reality. And we talked about this a little bit uh, last week. You know, distribution has been 
a little bit behind the power curve in some cases uh, adopting technology, CRM being an example. Across the boards, we see 80% uh, of companies have uh, adopted and implemented CRM, and, and you know, we also look at the, the levels of user adoption in distribution when we look at that, uh, that vertical uh, and do our, our data slicing there, we see that um, they, I, forget, I think it was uh, about 50% of companies um, had implemented CRM. So uh, slow to, I'm, I'm going to call it slow to adopt and lower levels of, um, of user adoption. And what that means is um, your cost of sales is going to be going up because you know you're you're not in you're not handling transactions in the most efficient high speed technology enabled way. If we turn the pyramid 90 degrees, the the thing and we talked about this last week. I'd like to talk about it in a little different way this week. Um, yeah, and the vendors have good products and services, and uh, preferred suppliers have some track record and actually understand how people use those products and services you know, on an ongoing basis. Again, these are the kinds of things that buyers today are accessing online, you know, on the web, through user groups, uh, industry reviews, all of these things that are available online when they want it, however they want it, uh, immediately. You know, they're, they're number of um, articles out now talking about the fact that the, the buying process buyers are often you know anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70 percent of the way through the buying process before they contact a seller a sales rep and in some cases they go through the entire thing and handle it all online so when you look at this and I'm going to back up here for a second and this combination it's not that the vendor preferred supplier level is bad or um, you know that you can't be of service and have good relationships but what it means is if that if you're relegated to that and you're still operating with uh, field-based reps uh, calling on accounts you know how are the wife and kids what do you need today you know, I don't I don't mean to to diminish this, but you're act actually sort of handicapping yourself, and you're going to find yourself further and further behind the competition. So, Dave, I'm going to just take a quick break here and see if you have anything you want to add to that before I jump into the process discussion. Uh, no, I think that's uh, great information. You know, um, talked about uh, one VP of sales, a very large national distribution company and uh, they have not implemented technology and you know their reps are um, Dave I know we talked about this a little bit their reps are a hundred percent commission and the company has grown to good size over you know a long lifetime um, but now he describes his reps as selling by wandering around and it you know it just it kind of begs the question, is there a better way we could do this? And I think the answer is absolutely. We're going to talk about a couple of those. So moving ahead, that's relationship. We talked about a process last week. We've, we've defined four levels of um, sales process prowess or sales process implementation. Level one being ad hoc or um, uh, uh, informal. Basically, everybody's doing their own thing. It doesn't mean you're anti-process. It just means that everybody's doing their own thing. Level two, um, informal or tribal wisdom. Uh, there is a sales process that's been documented. Reps are exposed to it. They're expected to use it, but that use is neither reinforced nor enforced. Uh, level three, formal process, just the opposite. There is a process that's been documented. It is reinforced. It is enforced. Um, and monitored, and at the highest level, dynamic process, level four, uh, all of that, plus constantly looking at the, at the real-time analytics, you know, what's changing. Uh, level four companies are much better at anticipating 
change rather than simply reacting to it. Again, if you want to know more about that, um, we had some discussion last week. I want to approach it a little differently this week, which is, um, you know, this is kind of a classic consultant diagram and process model. And what you see on the left is an arrow into the box, and on the right is an arrow out of the box. And to the extent that the arrow on the right output is different from the input, something happened in the box, and that's process. And uh, if you look at this, uh, you know, fairly simple diagram should look familiar to all of you because uh, this is the model that you know gets talked about all the time in sales, where you have an arrow into the pipe on the left, which are leads, and an arrow out of uh, the right, out of the pipe on the right, which are the orders. And if you ask consultants what converted leads into orders, they'll say sales process. If you ask sales reps what converted leads into orders, they'll say magic. And as it turns out, the reps are probably at least as correct on this as the consultants, and in some cases more so. When we talk to groups, one of the things I ask for a number of years, uh, I did sales training, and you know, virtually everybody's been exposed to one training program or another. And the question I ask is, has anybody ever done it completely right? You know, gone to a program, drunk the Kool-Aid, really gotten on board with the you know the methodology, worked it, worked it, worked it, and really followed an opportunity from beginning to end, and somehow at the end lost the deal. You know, did it right, but lost the deal. And the answer is probably everybody's had that experience. The flip side of that is, has anybody basically, you know, it's sometimes harder to get people to raise their hand on this, but has anybody basically been a doofus, you know, almost like Bill Murray does sales, and kind of been fumbling along and Finally, the buyer just says, here, let me help you out. Here's the order. And, you know, you basically did everything wrong, but you got the order. Well, that's magic. You know, it, it's not manufacturing. It's selling. And there's good magic and there's bad magic, but in fact, it's not pure process. So when we come back to this model, uh, there are some things to learn and to start really addressing when we talk about process implementation. And the first is, this is straight out of um, uh, statistical process control and all of the total quality management stuff. If you improve the quality of the input and do nothing else, don't change the process at all, but improve the quality of the input, you'll get better output. And everybody knows that, but um, they don't really practice it. And so in manufacturing, which is where these models come from, they have guys standing on the back dock that are measuring, you know, QA guys that are on the back dock testing stuff before it comes in. And if it, if certain percentage don't pass, that whole pallet gets sent back. They don't get into the plant. Um, in sales, we're not nearly as rigorous about the quality of the input. And here's the test that I use all the time, and I've been making this bet for years. I still have my house. We don't have to get into my betting the house today, but I will say I'm willing to bet a big number. And this, is, this has been consistently true over time. Right now, you have good people working hard, trying to get business you actually don't want. And every time I've presented that to a group, and I, you know, I hope that some of you are out there right now nodding your head, you know, that's your experience. And you have to ask, how does that keep happening? And last week, Dave talked a lot about, you know, different measures for identifying profitability and actual cost of customers and some of their systems for identifying and tracking that, seeing who are the profitable customers, what is the real cost of pursuing this account versus another. Um, so they can help you with that a lot, but even on the most basic scale, how do you define a quality prospect, what we call a perfect prospect profile? Are you doing that in a consistent way uh, in improving your output? The other thing that, um, that happens in manufacturing is they control the environment and the process, and because of that, they're able to uh, 
uh, control, said another way, predict the output. In sales, we don't control the environment. You know, best case, you're probably meeting on neutral ground. Often you're meeting on their, their territory. And there are actually two things going on here in the box. One is the selling process, but the other is the buying process. And the question you have to ask is, is your process today aligned with your customer's buying process? You know, we could do a whole webinar just on that, which hey, we aren't going to On that previous today. slide, yep. the, um, Im the improved input on the <clears throat> in the sales environment would be better qualification, in your opinion? Um, Better qualification, I think, is actually the beginning of the process. Identifying, when we say perfect prospect profile, our definition of that, sort of our working definition, is those folks that if you get them in the pipeline, if you identify opportunities with them, um, you win 80% of the time. You, wear, you win your unfair share of the business. So. Um, uh, I know some of your folks are either in aerospace or automotive. You know, they've picked a niche that they go after. But even within that, there's probably, you know, there are demographic things, like they're within a certain radius of our facilities, or they're a certain size, or they, um, they work on certain kinds of, um, of projects or in installations. Um, but they're also psychographic. Um, criteria that you can look at in terms of, um, you know, they, they value quality or the expertise that we bring to the party. You know, it's not just, uh, if we go back to the, the relationship pyramid, they don't, you know, use us free, for free consulting, pick our brains and our engineers' uh, brain power and know-how, uh, and then turn around and buy from somebody else because it's, you know, a lower cost. So that they actually value the relationship and the expertise that you bring to the party. And, you know, we talked about this last week. You know, friendship is worth an eight. So you still can't just, you know, charge anything you want uh, as if there's no price sensitivity. But folks that value quality and expertise and know-how and are willing to pay a little bit more for it would be an example of a, of a lead criterion that you could apply, and and if they're not that that way, if they're not oriented in that way, it doesn't mean you can't do business with them. But you should know going in, you're not going to win them over because you you contributed all this know-how because they are going to just turn around and buy from the lowest, uh, you know, the lowest price source. As an example. Great. Thank you. Um. So we put these two together, the levels of relationship and the levels of process implementation into what we call the SRP matrix, sales relationship process matrix. And again, we went through this in some detail uh, last week, but um, here's what it looks like when we apply the survey data. Dave, you want to move this ahead for some reason? My page down just isn't happening. Um, what we've defined are three levels of performance, and you can see performance level one now is about 24% of firms, 43% at level two, and 33% this year are level three. Um, what is exciting and challenging at the same time uh, for those who are at the lower levels here, uh, six years ago when we started this matrix, 17% of firms were level three. Uh, last year, 29% of firms were level three. This year, fully a third of firms now qualify as level three performance. And what that means is if you're back here at level one, um, you're watching your competitors' taillights get small really fast. They're just pulling away from you. The question is, what can you do to move up and over? Turns out implementing process is probably the easier road to go. Uh, you absolutely do want to move up through levels of relationship, but again, you know, there are two parties involved here. There's your effort and interest in um, elevating relationships, but there's also the buying side of the equation. And this is as perceived from the customer side. But on this axis, on the horizontal axis, you have control over 
what processes you you define and how and whether your folks are following adhering to those processes and what resources and systems and technology you bring in to support them in that so um, it in our view it's easier to move over and up than trying to move up and over and one of the things we talked about last week are these two grayed out cells we sort of call no-fly zones there may be individuals that operate uh, in an ad hoc you know sort of random way uh, that are still perceived as trusted partners by their customers, but we haven't identified any companies that operate that way, companies of any size anyway, that uh, are perceived at the highest level of relationship. Similarly, uh, we haven't found any companies that have implemented sales process at the dynamic level that aren't at least preferred supplier level or above. And the four metrics, and we went through this last week, so. Uh, we, we had all those numbers and you can see them, but there are four metrics that we look at to define um, these performance levels, and they are the percentage of reps meeting or beating quota, the uh, percentage of overall revenue plan attained by the company, uh, forecast accuracy, which we're going to talk about a little bit here in a minute, and total rep turnover that we're also going to talk about. And um, Again, if you go back and look at last week's uh, figures, uh, there's, there are dramatic differences between performance levels one, two, and three with respect to those four metrics. So moving on, um, here are some of the stats that we teased you with um, okay, uh, in the invitation. And these are from uh, the uh, SPO survey data, and these are with respect to distribution firms only. Um, firms, distribution firms with, without, and with CRM. I'll do this in the order they're presented here, left to right. So without CRM, customer relationship management technology implemented, and with CRM, uh, here are a few of those metrics. Voluntary rep turnover, you can see it's 18 versus 11 percent. Percentage of reps meeting, beating quota, 49 versus 58. A couple of others, uh, these are not part of the SRP matrix qualification, but they were of interest to me. The percentage of initial calls leading to presentation greater than 50%, look at that, it's almost threefold, 5% versus 14. Rep ramp up time to full productivity taking longer than a year, 53 versus 44. Uh, percentage of marketing generated leads, and this speaks to the issue of you know, your rep's time and you know, are they developing their own leads or are they getting leads, you know, supplied by others? Look at this, almost two to one, 12% versus 23. And this last one, um, when we survey various abilities, in this case, the ability to different, differentiate versus the competition, uh, and you'll see this in a couple of charts I'm going to present in a second, it's either needs improvement, meets expectations, exceeds expectations, or don't know. And in this area, you can see, look at this, zero exceeding expectations versus 17%. So big, big differences in performance. But let's dive into a couple of these. This rep ramp up time is uh, really, I think, pretty eye-catching. And uh, we're going to spend a few minutes on it. In 2003, now this is across the whole survey population. We're going to get down to DISTI in just a minute, but across the entire population, the general survey population in 2003, 14.5% of reps were up to speed in a quarter or less. Uh, and 11.5% took more than a year. So these are color coordinated here. Four years later, that 11.5% greater than a year jumped up to 27.8, almost 28%. And the less than three months, it dropped from 14.5 down to 4.5, 4.7%. So you can see just taking much longer over that period of time. And I had a, uh, a conversation, a, a lunch meeting with a fellow, and he said, you know, are they not getting the quality of reps, or are these people just slower on the uptake, or, you know, just not dedicated? And I think that's completely wrong. Uh, he's involved with a couple of university programs, and obviously, you know, with our um, 
advisory services and research clients. You know, I'm continually impressed with the hard work, dedication, smarts that you know the reps bring to the table every day. But there are things that are making it much more difficult. Uh, the, the products are more complex uh, and are becoming increasingly complex over time. In, um, uh, introduction of new products, uh, introduction into new markets, uh, increased competitive activity, all of those things are making it tougher for reps to get up to speed and be fully productive with their peers, um, you know, and, and dragging out the rep ramp up time. Here's where it's gone. This year, look at this, the, um, the greater than six months, six to 12 months now, jumped up from 38% in, uh, in 2007 to now over 42% in 2012. And you can see this red uh, figure here, greater than a year, is now 21%. Now again, this is across the entire survey population, okay, a couple thousand firms. I want you to look at that red section there, greater than a year, 21%. Here's what it is for distribution. 42%. It's exactly double uh, taking a year or more to get up to speed. And it's not surprising. I mean, when you look at, you know, sort of the wide, wide range of, um, of products that are being represented, and in many cases, the special expertise and, um, you know, inside knowledge and know-how for reps to really be adding value, it's not surprising that it takes up to a year to, uh, to get up to speed. Uh, and you can see, you know, each of these is, is pretty stretched out. 16% uh, are taking three to six months. This is pretty eye-catching. Nobody is coming in in less than three months, which really speaks to the complexity and the demands, you know, the, the increasing demands of the buyers on, uh, on sales reps. And Dave, I'm going to take another breather here and see if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, you know, I think it would be very interesting <clears throat> to look at this uh, side by side with a metric on uh, rep turnover, because I think there's some parallels that can be drawn there and talk about a double cost whammy is, you know, if it takes uh, greater than a year for a rep to get up to speed and, and really start generating uh, healthy commissions, that I think their, their defection rate may be higher at those firms as well. Well, I think there are two things that happen. Number one, the defection rate is higher. I mean, reps are going to stay where they think their success is, you know, they have a better chance to succeed and where their success is supported. The other is, you know, what are we doing from the company side uh, to either help or hurt, you know, the turnover uh, metric. And one example, a, a high-tech company that shall remain unnamed, this is, by the way, this is an exercise. You don't need consultants. You don't need, you know, any special systems. This is an exercise worth doing, and that is, you know, you may have some idea right now of how long, the folks in the audience, how long it actually takes to get your folks up to speed, but you already have this information, and it's in your payroll system. So if you go back through the last couple years and just see who you brought on board and when they started earning, you know, comparable to the folks that were already on board, you'll find out how long it really takes for them to get up to full speed. And when we've done this with clients, the average is a third longer than they thought. So if they thought it took six months, it really took eight months. If they thought it took you know nine months, it really took a year. And this one company that uh, was just a stunning example, it actually took 18 months when they went back, we did the, you know, we actually went through the records, took 18 months for reps to get up to full speed. And what was, you know, when I talk about the company compounding the problem, it wasn't just defections. They were firing reps after 15 months if they weren't making it. Hmm. So, I mean, it just, it just was, talk about a double whammy. I mean, it was, it was just nuts. And, you know, and of course, then you're just running harder and harder and falling further behind. Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, kind of an interesting chart. Um, it's theoretical, but the comparison of two companies, and it's also one of the things, Dave, last week you talked about, you know, all of the things that you have in your application. I know you'd be talking about a little bit. 
in terms of um, uh, you know profitability, not just looking at gross profits, but looking at net profitability as well, net margin. Um, one of the things in sales is we always talk about you know did you make your number, and uh, this is looking at two companies over a three-year period. So in this case, from December 08 through December 11. And you can see we updated it because we've been using this chart for a long time. It used to be 01 through 04. I didn't know those were going to show up. In any event, um, company A is the jagged red line. Company B is the little squiggly dark line. And plan or quota is the straight line going through all of that. And what you need to know is the area under all three lines is the same. So both companies made their number. Okay. The red line is plus or minus 50% volatility, and the dark squiggly line is plus or minus 5%. But they both made their number each year. And what you'll see are these peaks, sort of, you know, the end of the half and at the end of the year, and then lo and behold, it happened again here and here. And, you know, everybody's familiar with sort of the hockey stick run up that happens at ends of quarters and particularly at the end of year. Um, that's what we're trying to show here. Now, the reason I bring this up and talk to groups about it is everybody's talking about making the number. These folks made the number. They both did that. Okay, so if we said they're in the same industry, you know, one's not selling, you know, jelly bean semiconductor chips and the other one's selling, you know, locomotives or satellites. If we assume they're in the same business, um, you know, same cyclical variation, relatively same size opportunities, so on. There, there are distinctions that you can make. There are conclusions that you can draw just looking at this chart. And Dave, we actually had this. I did this with you. You know, when we were getting ready for this. What are a couple that you see just looking at this? Yeah, I think uh, last time I had mentioned unpredictability. Mm-hmm. And what about predictability? Uh, in terms of uh, predictability, well, obviously it uh, it helps in predicting revenue, uh, forecasting expenses, um, and so forth. Yeah, predictability is actually a big, big deal that comes out of this. Um, the kinds of things that come with more accurate forecasts are your staffing levels. Okay, you can resource allocation. Uh, inventory control and inventory purchases. Uh, one uh, manufacturing company in the upper Midwest, um, we talked about forecast accuracy, and the head of manufacturing said, if we could get an accurate sales forecast, it would save us tens of millions of dollars in buffer inventory. And this was mm -hmm. a, about a uh, $450, $500 million dollar Firm. So tens of millions of dollars was big, big money to them. But because they didn't have accurate forecasts, they wound up having to keep a lot of buffer stock around. Um, there are other things uh, when you have the kind of volatility you see with Company A here. They'll have more overtime. They'll have more sick time, uh, more expedited shipments, um, taking things apart, rebuilding them, You know, not going here, it's going over there instead. All of that kind of stuff all hurts profitability on the exact same revenue. Uh, one of the things I always sort of joke about is Company A is a more exciting place to work, but uh, it tends to, that excitement tends to burn people out. The other thing I'll just mention, we're going to move on, is if these were publicly traded companies, this notion of predictability is reinforced in the market. If these were publicly traded companies, Company B would have three or four times the market cap of Company A on the exact same revenue because of the predictability. And if they were privately held companies, banks would want to lend Company B more money on more favorable terms for longer periods because of that same thing of predictability. So making your number, yeah, I get it. That's an important thing to do. But some of those other measures that you were talking about last week, and maybe you're going to talk about a little bit before the end of today's uh, session, those speak directly to you know having your processes under control, knowing what customers cost, 
knowing what your sales efforts cost and really going after it. So, so moving on. On that, oh, sorry. on that slide, uh, wouldn't cash flow be, uh, be an impact of that as well, in your opinion? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, all of the resource allocation and planning and management, I mean, when you, when you have the kind of volatility that's shown here in Company A, it basically takes the bat out of every other functional area's hand, including finance. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is basically at effect. Okay, so let's look at it. Here is the quality of the output. Okay, these are this isn't um, pipeline. This is actual forecast. What one of the questions we ask is, what's the outcome of forecast deals? And this is for the general population. Okay, so commit. Um, blood, take it to the bank, whatever you call it in your company, yeah, we're going to win this. Uh, in general, uh, it's about 50-50. 49% of those deals are actually won, 28% are lost to the competition, and 23% go to no decision. Now, there are a couple of things to know about this. Um, from 2000. 2004 to about 2008, 2007, 2008, it was 50, 30, 20, 50, 30, 20. It was just, you know, rock solid of forecast deals. 50% were won, 30% were lost to the competition, 20% went to no decision. Uh, over the last, you know, three or four years, the big gainer has been no decisions. So we now see wins at just under 50%, uh, losses 28 it's all being picked up by no decisions, which means deals, quote unquote, deals or opportunities that went through the entire sales process and resulted in zero for anybody. So earlier, Dave, when you asked, well, does that mean better qualifying or qualifying earlier? It's like qualifying earlier, qualifying better, and qualifying throughout. There's no shame in losing a deal. The shame is in taking a long time to do it. Okay, so this is for the general population. Here's what it is for distribution. Look at this, drop down from 49% to 40.5%, 35.5% losses, and look at this, 24% no decisions. Nearly one in every four deals, it's gone through the entire sales cycle. Far enough, let me, let me put it different. It's gone far enough for the sales rep to say, you can put that on the board, you can take that to the bank. One, nearly one in four of those resulting in no decision. Here's what the numbers are for distribution. Man, this is this is big time expensive. What you're looking at here. Show you a couple of others, and then uh, Dave, I'll turn it back over to you. Unless you have some other thoughts you want to add to this. Um, when we look at can you advance to the next slide? Here we go. Prioritizing which accounts to focus on um, in your selling efforts. Now, this is, again, looking at the quality of the input. This is across the general population. I mentioned, you know, the way we do this. Do they need improvement? Do they meet expectations in prioritizing which accounts to focus their selling efforts on? Or do they exceed expectations? Across the general population, you see 47% say, yeah, we need to pick up our game, we need to improve there. 40% say we meet expectations. Look at these numbers for distribution, 80.5%. Not double, but man, this is big time area for improvement, 80 plus percent saying we need to improve on which accounts we go after. Look at this, you know, less than 3% saying we're exceeding expectations in this area. This is huge opportunity. and. Uh, you know, place for improvement. I um, thought I had one other here. Uh, I guess I didn't. So I think that, you know, identifying what a quality prospect is, you know, what is our perfect prospect profile, not just, you know, they're in the industry or they're in the zip code or whatever, but, you know, really getting beyond that and saying, what makes a quality prospect for our, for our company such that when uh, when we get their business, you know, it's profitable, they're relationship oriented, they play win-win, you know, it's all of those other good things. Uh, that's an exercise definitely worth doing and going after more of those folks 
10 fewer of the ones that you know I think you identify with your system that are just costing you loads and loads of time and money and resource but aren't really you know proving to be profitable I think a lot of times the argument or the justification is well it's base volume and they're helping you know s spread or absorb some of the cost but I think what you find with your system is they're not they're just adding costs to the system yeah yeah, not only do we focus on that uh, in terms of qualification of uh, new prospects, <clears throat> but largely also on uh, which active accounts to focus uh, efforts on, as well as uh, to invest in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, expenses, sales, and marketing related expenses. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you want to you invest where there's a good return uh, on any investment, and uh, customer, I don't think, is any different. Right. So I'll turn it back over to you at this point. Great. Well, thank you. I can't thank you enough, again, Barry, for uh, sponsoring our, our two series here and just some excellent data, uh, very uh, thought-provoking, uh, I know, for myself and, and I hope for the uh, attendees as well. And uh, would highly recommend everybody to, uh, to go out and visit CSO's website, uh, which is in later in the presentation here, but it's uh, CSOinsights.com. And uh, I go there quite often myself, look at uh, some of the, the data that they've made public and also participate in uh, some of their surveys. And if you get on their mailing list, you'll have the opportunity uh, to do some of those things, uh, you know, partake in some of those surveys as well. And, and the data is just, uh, just fantastic. So here is uh, some uh, contact information for uh, Barry. There's the website, as I mentioned, uh, also Barry's email address uh, and phone number. And as I said on the last presentation, if you'd like a copy of the entire slide deck from today, uh, my contact info will be at the end. Uh, feel free to email myself or uh, Barry as well, and we'll get you a copy of the, uh, the entire deck. So uh, in my portion, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how CRM technology can uh, boost sales productivity. So the, the title was the question, can it? And uh, we've, we've taken a look at some data both last week and this week, uh, and now I want to talk about how it can. Uh, so get into that a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, we offer a, a version of Microsoft Dynamics CRM that's specifically built for distribution and uh, supply chain as well. And uh, it's built, obviously, on the Microsoft Dynamics CRM platform, but tailored very highly towards distribution and supply chain. It also includes an integration to your back end or back office ERP or line of business systems, and that's where a lot of the power uh, that we're going to talk about for the next uh, 10 minutes uh, really comes from. It includes all the standard functionality for sales, marketing, customer service, and support, plus several modules that we've developed around, again, the specific needs of supply chain companies. Uh, so in our solution, we have sales call and expense tracking. Uh, we have a way uh, to forecast, and, or not even really forecast, but to actually look at uh, the reality in terms of true customer profitability. Better maintaining vendor relationships, sales history analysis, allowing you to do very targeted marketing all the way down to uh, product and, and vendor and product group type utilization. Integration with your website, quotation follow-up process, and so forth. So uh, this is not going to be a product demonstration, uh, so I would invite you to take a look at a video demonstration uh, that Microsoft actually produced on our solution. And if you just go to YouTube.com and search for Behringer AFSOC, you'll find uh, our library of videos, one of them being on our CRM product for distribution. Uh, you can also visit our website at Behringer.net. And under our solutions menu is CRM for wholesale distribution. And on that page is a uh, link to the video as well as other information. And we'd certainly invite you to uh, reach out to us directly and schedule an actual product demonstration. Uh, we do take the time to uh, talk with you up front to learn more about the challenges that your business is facing uh, and tailor a demonstration specifically for your company around those challenges. Uh, so uh, please reach out to us, uh, visit our website, shoot me an email. Uh, or give me a call directly and we'll get a uh, demonstration schedule. A little bit about the solution as we wrap up here. The Microsoft CRM product is available in a couple of different deployment models, which uh, is very unique to the industry as a whole uh, in that they offer this flexibility. One is their cloud-based solution called Microsoft CRM Online. The benefits to that are that it is a true software as a service platform, so the software is actually running off of equipment in Microsoft's data centers. 
it is a pay per user per month uh, type of application. Very limited infrastructure requirements. Really, there aren't any uh, infrastructure requirements whatsoever. As long as you have a laptop or a PC that has uh, uh, an Internet Explorer browser and uh, you know a semi-current version of Microsoft Office, you're you're pretty much ready to go. Very rapid time to value because we're not focusing our efforts on installing and configuring uh, servers and, and application and so forth. Uh, you're simply turning your account on and focusing more of your efforts on tailoring the solution uh, to solve your, uh, your challenges. There is the on-premise model, which is the traditional software uh, purchase model where you buy the licensing up front and then you pay an ongoing software maintenance cost. There are uh, certainly some infrastructure requirements if you're going on-premise. And it does offer for greater capabilities for both customization and uh, integration to other systems. Uh, we typically find that it's about a two and a half year return on investment on buying the product as opposed to renting it through the cloud-based model. Uh, and that's calculated just by taking the cost of the license, dividing it by the monthly cost uh, for the online model, and you'll come out to about two and a half years. Now, what that doesn't include are any investments that you might have to make in infrastructure, as well as uh, investments in maintaining the application if you have it on-premise. I'm going to get too deep into that, so we can certainly take offline and, and discuss further. And then a third model is the partner-hosted model. Uh, allows you all the benefits of on-premise software, uh, but in a pay-per-user-per-month model. That's a great scenario for people that don't want to uh, maintain it. So uh, again, just a couple more slides here, and uh, and we'll conclude and uh, invite you to come out and uh, view the video and, and schedule a demonstration as well. So the Microsoft CRM application is a, is truly built right into Microsoft Outlook. It's not an add-in. And a lot of the solutions, the CRM solutions on the market, uh, do some level of integration with Outlook. Uh, but Microsoft's product is the only one that's truly fully integrated. So you see a screenshot there. and. Uh, this has a lot to do with end user adoption that, that most of the uh, people that were that will be using CRM, they spend a lot of their day in email and uh, certainly Microsoft has a huge chunk of the market share with Outlook and, and Exchange Server. So when you deploy CRM functionality to those users in a tool that they're already using, the end user adoption uh, goes way up. Um, also there's some really nice integration points uh, with the integration that they have in Outlook. One of them is email capture. So as your users are sending and receiving email to and from uh, internal people as well as customers, prospects, suppliers, and so forth, those emails can be captured in the history of the records inside CRM. So you can completely delete them from Outlook and they will remain attached to a customer, a prospect, or a vendor uh, in CRM. You can even link emails to things much more specific, like sales opportunities and, and things like that. Again, we could get more into that in a uh, in an actual demonstration. Today, mobility uh, very very uh, top of mind for most of us, especially in distribution, where you typically have an outside sales team that spends a lot of the time in the field. Uh, and today, there's just a plethora of devices. I know myself; I have uh, several devices. I have an Android tablet, an Android phone, an iPad, a laptop. So uh, mobility is, is very important to make the system accessible and functional for uh, your users. So some great mobility solutions for Microsoft CRM. Uh, there's built-in mobility as well as a couple third-party applications that extend upon that. And it works with virtually any device that uh, is in the market today from, from all the iDevices through Android, BlackBerry, uh, and of course Windows smartphones. And the third-party uh, mobility applications for Microsoft CRM also offer an offline client. And that's helpful if your reps spend a lot of time in areas where they just don't have any connectivity, or if they travel a lot by airplane, uh, for example. Then they can still work in the system, access data, add records, update records, and so forth. And uh, that's done in an offline fashion, and then it synchronizes back uh, when you have connectivity. Uh, we do offer a uh, just an exceptional data integration tool for integrating Microsoft CRM with your back office ERP and line of business systems. And uh, this product is called DataSync Cloud. It is a, a completely hosted solution, and it is real time uh, with your back end system. And it really works with any SQL server oriented database. However, there are some ERP products that we've already completely developed the integration around. 
It is a Microsoft Azure-based application. So Azure is Microsoft's cloud development platform. So it's a complete cloud-based application. And some of the benefits here is that there's no hardware or software to buy and no costly upfront development fees associated with beta integration products. Uh, it's also not proprietary to any ERP system. Uh, it really uh, uh, it works off of the SQL Server database. So the benefit uh, largely here being that it's very non-technical. Uh, we can provision your account uh, and have data flowing uh, very quickly. And it's uh, sold in a low monthly per user uh, based fee uh, based on the amount of active users that you have in your CRM system. So if you'd like more information on that, certainly uh, visit our website or, or give us a call. As I said before, we have an entire uh, demonstration that Microsoft produced on our solution for distribution. And uh, again, if you go out to youtube.com, search on Behringer ASSOC, you'll find it there. Uh, or you can uh, come to our website, go under Solutions, uh, and look at the CRM for Distribution page. There's a link to the video there as well. And I really invite you to, to contact us and schedule a private demonstration. Again, we really take the time up front to learn more about the challenges that your company faces and, and tailor a demonstration around that. And no two implementations of CRM are the same. Uh, we've worked with uh, two uh, industrial suppliers, for example, that sell largely the same vendor lines and so forth. And if you put them side by side, their CRM implementations can be completely different. It's really just based around uh, your own individual unique challenges and goals. So please reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to uh, get you scheduled for a, uh, a demonstration of the technology. So I don't see uh, any questions in the question pane. If you have any, uh, please enter them now as we start to wrap up. Again, I, I really want to thank Barry uh, from CSO Insights. I hope everybody enjoyed the content uh, that he brought, just some just amazing data and, and very thought provoking. And uh, if you'd like some more information, again, please visit uh, CSO's website at csoinsights.com. Again, I'm Dave Buggy with Behringer Associates. We'd love to talk to you more about your CRM needs and uh, schedule you for a demonstration. So my contact info is uh, here on the screen with my direct dial and my email address as well.